Bonne locale, mon chéris, and welcome back to Red and Sev Watch a Movie for this part two of something, I, I don't know, don't think we actually needed a part two, but I'm also kind of glad we're doing it because in this episode we're going to be discussing The Patriot again, although this time we're going to focus on what we want to focus on, and that's Colonel Tavington. <laughs> Colonel Tavington is a fascinating character, and if there's anyone who's a genuine patriot in the film, it's certainly it's not him. Mel... Yeah, it's certainly not Mel Gibson's character. <laughs> but yes, Colonel Tavington is a fascinating study. Uh, as we said in the previous episode, he was designed based off of... Oh, cr I just forgot the, uh, the, the colonel's name. He was supposed to be Bannister Tavington, but he was just early Mad Jack. Yeah, that's what it was. Everyone says he's based off of, um, he's based off of, uh, Tavleton, but no, they, they took a, they took a lot of liberty, even to call him Mad Jack is a bit extreme, because Mad Jack was crazy, but he wasn't a church-burning psychopath. House-burning psychopath, sure. Church-burning? <laughs> no. Even he would have gotten his shit chewed out for that one. But I mean, on the subject of, of you know, patriotism, here's this man who genuinely believes in the cause of protecting the colonies for queen and country. To the point where, toward the end of the film, he is actively deciding, look, I'll do what you need me to do, but there's no way I can return home an honorable man if I do. So let's talk about Ohio. Which, by the way, uh, Ohio didn't have a name at that point. Ohio was not a concept at that point. They, they didn't even consider expansionism at that point to many no. treaties. Yeah. At that hmm. point, technically, every state, uh, was, or rather, colony, was designated as existing from the coast on the uh, on the from the eastern coast to the western coast, wherever that may be. It wasn't until like 1840 that the entirety of the country had been mapped out, and it turned out well, the country just kept going west further and further. So him saying it, you know, towards the end there, let's discuss Ohio, uh, you know, as a, as a veiled attempt to describe him uh, wanting to, you know, to basically have, you know, governorship over uh, one of the colonies. Or uh, it wasn't governorship because they actually discussed... Um, they earlier discussed Cornwallis get, getting that part, so... Right, but it, was, uh, it wasn't it was based on governorship, it was based on uh, some other aristocratic landowners model. And I can't remember exactly how they described it, but all things considered, that's uh, that's some really interesting politics to stick into, you know, all the politics that are already going on. Honestly, I think they were trying to force the idea that the British would impose almost a sovereign style plantator's ownership aristocracy on the West, otherwise. Possibly, although that wasn't really what they were going for. England wanted to maintain their colonies. Yeah, that's the thing, I'm talking about the movie itself, because right. there's around Emmerich on fucking film saying, oh, I wasn't going for accuracy, I was going for a feeling. <sighs> yeah, the feeling of missing your daddy. Oh, wait, did I say that out loud? <laughs> LT chill. So, uh, I mean, he, other things about Tavington that I found fascinating was just how calculating he was. Because they, they only show it in, in like cuts and slices, but Tavington's always the guy with the spyglass standing, you know, a hundred feet or, uh, uh, you know, a hundred yards, a thousand yards east of everyone and keeping an eye at a distance. Like the scene where, uh, where, uh, Martin, Mel- He's uh, analyzing, but actually fucking thinking, but at the same yeah. time, not just the guy in the back lines. You can see that when, uh, shit comes to think, he's actually the first man in his line, just like Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. When it comes down to those end scenes, he's right there in the thick. He's not sitting at the back lines. <laughs> he's sitting right behind his first row of archers. Actually, even 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 along with them, yeah, and he's I at the just, head of the charge. And it's such a fascinating character study when you start thinking about that movie from an angle that isn't uh, American jingocentrism. It's actually even more fascinating when you read the actual book that was publicly released. Because let's have a little comparison. According to this book, that was licensed and sold along with the movie. 
Okay, let's look at Benjamin Martin's backstory before the war. We, of course, we know he only quartered a bunch of people. We know that. But what's his original backstory? He was an orphan, raised by a pastor, got married, and the only time he realized his mistake when his wife gave him a fucking timeout between Gabriel and Thomas that was like five years long from bed. After he, his ki kid gets killed, he suddenly becomes... Benjamin What's Martin Tavington's a... backstory? Tavington's a much more fascinating backstory, much more involved backstory, all things considered. Yeah, I mean, he's... Um, he's described as a only child of a noble family. His father squandered everything away. He was a drunkard, a gambler. Again, I told you about this little rumor about his backstory that he... It was never confirmed. He may or may not witness his father murder his mother. He actually, when he's a, I guess a teenager, takes all the money that's left from his father, rips it out of his throat and fucks off to London, lives there, and the moment the war breaks out, he actually says up front he doesn't like what's happening in the colonies. It's an offense to the crown, it's offense to the king, it's an offense to his motherland. What's going on? And he invests what's left of what he has into his commission, and he actually borrows more to buy that commission on a silver tongue. So he's got fucking Debs back left in uh, England waiting to get his ass on top of when he goes to the colonies. And this is the thing, he was only able to buy a rank of lieutenant. The moment we mm -hmm. see him as colonel, this is what, according to the book, he earned himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, one interesting detail for historical purposes in the very least is the fact that at this time you literally had to, I mean, this was a lot like the Roman armies where you did have to buy your way into a commissioned officer's role. You basically had to show your financial support for the military in a, you know, as compared to today where it's mostly having the education to operate as an officer. You know, even 300 years ago, it was a matter of, okay, how much, you want to be an officer? How much money you got? Uh, well, that's, that's enough to become a fucking silver lieutenant. <laughs> right? And we're talking about uh, Tavington's family. Yes, his family had no, had, was nobility, but it was like nobility in name only, right? Yeah, it, it, like, like the... It, Back a few generations, yes, his family was a big family, but at that point in the story, you know, it's they were basically living off the value of their name and little more. Pretty much. So, I mean, here we have someone who's, you know, aware of not only the, the glory, but also the shortcomings of England. And, you know, for that, you know, for someone to come around and say, look, I really, really want to spend some time killing these traitors because to him that's exactly what these Amer what they these are. revolutionaries were traitors Trick. absolutely treasonous to the crown considering these were prize colonies i mean it's not like the united states was anything like australia at that point australia was a very different the colony Australia wasn't even discovered by then yet <laughs> true but uh to the same you know to the same standards people who get went to the states it wasn't only prisoners. It was a very broad mix of people because of the diverse options available in the colonies. You could travel to the southern col uh, you could travel to the to Virginia to Georgia, these areas, and you would be able to make a killing off farming in a way you never would have in England proper. Uh, you could travel to um, the northern states and conduct trade on a level that was completely unheard of in England because. England's a very small place, and most of its trade was already being handled at that point. I mean, the South Sea Companies was 1720. So, and for Wait, Tavington, well. yeah, for Tavington to say, I would like to travel halfway around the world, well, I guess, I guess it would be, yeah, halfway around the world, uh, and fight for the glory of my nation to defend these colonies which belong to the crown. That's actually quite impressive to me. That's a lot more impressive to me than, oh, you killed my son. Now you've killed my other son, who I totally put in the line of danger in the first place. 
And, and he did, by the way. Martin really fucked up there. He, you have you have uh, the older son Gabriel running off on a horse, and everyone chasing after him. Well done with the discipline there, father. Aren't you glad you promoted I mean, that 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 child to corporal at that point? I mean, at this point, I mean, look at every one of Martin's children. What kind of a parent is he, especially in those days, with kids that totally ignore him and put him to a fact that has already become? Daddy, I'm joining the military. I'm telling you this in front of the fucking sign-up board. Mm -hmm. Daddy, I'm getting married. Oh, look, the reverend and my bride is just like coming onto the card. I am not asking you about something. I'm putting you into a, to a fact that's coming to pass already. You just got to deal with it. Yeah, that Gabriel. Was, that was total disrespect for his father, especially oh, Absolutely. Back but at the same time, it was perhaps a far more noble and patriotic movement by Gabriel Martin than even uh, Benjamin Martin had taken, you know, throughout the movie, if anything. I mean, I, I kind of get where English people come from when they talk about this film. Because, you know what, the, for all the attempts to paint the, the English as if, they're the, as if they're 1940s Nazis, if you actually watch the film, I don't think Benjamin's the hero. Sure, he gets the girl, but if the movie was about 15 minutes shorter, I'm pretty sure the movie, you could probably say that the movie's about Gabriel and not Benjamin Martin. Gabriel and maybe Ta Gabriel and Tavington, but oh, not yeah. Martin. Yeah. yeah. And that would have been a, that's a much more fascinating character comparison of the two personalities, you know, scaled up as it were, of, you know, the, the revolutionaries uh, who wanted independence in the colonies and the uh, loyalists who came in to protect the colonies as crown grounds. Now, uh, still, you've got, you know, these scenes in which Tavington is just gobbles in disguise, but... Uh, uh, wait, not Goebbels. We'll Goring. Goring was the name I was looking for. But, the, I mean, it's it's pretty much fiction, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, they're trying to... I, I, I think they're trying to make a point about... Because it's, like it's not like he's the only person who commits a complete fucking atrocity, right? Yes, he I mean, burnt down that church. I mean, arguably, yes, but arguably Martin did the worst thing. Because, see, this is the thing. Even if he burned down the church... Let's compare even suffering factors. In a building like that, the people that would have been in there, they would have been knocked out conscious by the mm -hmm. smoke and the emissions much faster than they would have even felt the fire. Yeah. Okay? They would have been done mm -hmm. by that point. What did Martin do? He Six. literally quartered people alive. Yeah. And this is the thing. What was my point the last time when I was saying what he was saying, but... Oh, we left two of them alive. Wouldn't left we left two of them to tell about it being enough? Why does he say alive? That's like accenting something. And yeah, this is where nice. my point came about him actually leaving mutilated people alive to just be able to speak, but still be mutilated. Fortunately, that is a big part of the character too, because for all their attempts to say, how did you change towards the end between Gabriel and Benjamin? The fact of the matter is, he hadn't changed. Benjamin hadn't think... changed at all. Exactly, he hadn't changed at all. Uh, if anything, Tavington has a much better arc in the fact that he's willing to humble himself before Cornwallis, something he doesn't do throughout the rest of the movie. But he certainly does at that point. He, you know, we getting back to that scene where they're sitting in the office together and he's like, if you want me to do this for you, you're going to have to give me a safe place to live here. I, you know, that, that, it's not a huge change. It's not a, it's not an enormous arc, but at the same time, it's an arc. It's, he's, think, he's thinking, he's calculating, mm -hmm. and he's reevaluating. He's reevaluating his actions. He's, and he takes that entire, it's, it's not like he's burning churches through the entire film either. Yeah. Or the entire book, for that matter. Uh, for the most part, he's a he's a tactician at heart, and the only way he can get these, you know, 
this gorilla outfit, for lack of a better word, to come out of the woods is to piss them off, is to hit them yeah. in the heart, right? Pretty much. He, he's, he's playing the, I mean, it's another one of those parallels that I think are, is quite interesting because you've got the parallels between uh, between Benjamin and uh, Tavington, right? You've got two men who have a long history of being absolutely horrible people, mm -hmm. right? And then you have this parallel between their tactics, right? Because you've got Benjamin Martin, who is training these militia men to attack from the forest. He's training them in guerrilla tactics. Now, Tavington looks at this and says, you know, admittedly well ahead of its time for, for tactics, but it makes for good cinema, you know, a good film. He says, all right. These people are going to hide in the woods and shoot at us. How do we make them come out? Well, we attack the places they're not defending while we're, they're hiding in the woods. We attack their families. And as atrocious as that may be, it's not more atrocious than Benjamin Martin did. If anything, it's directly on par considering the code of honor these two groups were going by. It certainly is. And you know what's the other uh, actual funny thing when you look at uh, the comparisons between the two? Hmm. Okay, one comes out of a absolutely horrible family, which is Stavington, and then there's Martin, who was coddled, even though he was an orphan, but he was coddled by a reverend as a favored orphan. So you get the fucking coddled child turning into this, and. Uh, how is someone from a fucked up place supposed to get any better? If yeah. anything, I got yeah. sympathy for the first one. Sympathy for Not the devil. One. <laughs> and but the devil makes sense, at least. Yes, and that's that's what makes this... I mean, honestly, this is why this movie doesn't rank very high for me, but doesn't like get a flat-out zero, either. Because there are some amazing ideas in there, and if they had just, I don't know, made up a war instead of trying to put it in the Pretty American much. Revolutionary War... Yeah the movie would have been fucking amazing. You know what's another funny uh, social thing that's found in the book, but it's not described in the movie? Hmm. In the movie, you get pressure on the fact that Martin starts a family and has these seven children, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually. Even though it takes some time to his wife back after she finds out what he did. And this is praised in the book. Do you know what's said about Tavington as if uh, try to de demonize him? Hmm. He's a womanizer. That's all that said. He's, yeah. Womanizer. Yeah. Woo, woo. Yeah. He pursued women with the ferocity of a bloodhound. I believe that's the quote. I'm sorry, isn't that praiseworthy? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, honestly, I don't know. I don't know what Gibson was thinking. I don't know what Emmerich was thinking. I certainly I don't know. know what what her, what Rodat was thinking. Yeah, I don't know what Rodat was thinking. This Everything about this could have been better. And that's part of the problem. I'm usually very easy on movies, right? I, I just want to watch a movie to turn my brain off and have a little bit of, you know, enjoyment. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, an excellent critic in that regard because I have to sit down and watch a movie like two, three times if I want to actually critique it. But this film, I mean, it stands out. It stands out as just, especially if you've studied any American history. So let so if we take American history out of the picture, what we're left with is a terrible protagonist who has basically no development except for what they try and force on us as possible development in a conversation with his son about having changed because he got married. Clearly he didn't, 16 times with a hatchet. <laughs> and then you have this villain. A, a villain on par with some of the best villains in history, on in, in fiction, honestly. You know? Uh, One that you can relate with much more than any yeah, so it's, positive character in that. It's just kind of like... It's like Far Cry villains, right? You don't care about the main character very much in Far Cry. You're in it because the villains are fucking creepy, they're evil to an amazing extent, and you want to see how far they're going to take this insanity. So, yeah, I, I do stand by my 13 out of 50 stars 
on this. Uh, I'm wondering where you stand. See, this is the thing. My thing about standing about this movie is that I think there's a third one that needs to be a summary of the whole, and I'm still in it, still living it for that because there's things left. Are we really going to do three movies or three videos on The Patriot? I think it deserves it because there's still a lot of shit like, I mean, we have actually misnumbered and that I mean misdated bad grounds. True. We need to talk about that one from the educational point of view. It wouldn't be fair otherwise. Well, I've been trying to cover the historical stuff, but I guess so. If that's the case, I guess you guys are just going to have also, to fucking uh, wait. There's gonna be one more, but yeah, I mean, tell us yourselves, who do you think is the more relatable on this episode? Do you rely with the fictionalized, I mean, Martin, Benjamin, who, hmm? Mel Gibson, the Australian. I mean, ironically, another Australian, but actually a better actor, which is Heath Ledger. We all like him, right? And then there is Tavington. Played by McDonald's hamburger. Tell us in the comments. Oh. Jason Isaacs, you will always be Tavington. But yes, Please. tell us in the comments. And also tell us in the comments who you think was more of a patriot. Mm -hmm. Because for a movie called The Patriot, I still stand by the statement that, well, Benjamin Martin They're wasn't really one. Martin. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that being said, I guess we will catch you in the third installment of our Patriot Rundown. Like, Until when? share, subscribe, and support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay.